I have a confession to make. I am an overachiever, and I'm hyper-responsible. So this is important for you to know because I think anyone who might exhort you to have a big vision, you should know beforehand that I'm the sort of person that if someone said, you should go, you, you, should, you should go have a big vision, I would say, oh, okay, all right, I will, and I'll get it organized, and we'll have it, and we'll have it done in a couple of weeks, and okay, here we go. So I just, I'm just telling you. I just want to warn you in advance that perhaps if we are supposed to have a big vision, that there might be a lot of ways for us to get there. And they're not necessarily the way that I would do it, or the way that you would do it, or you would do it, or you would do it. And probably we all need to be doing those things together. So how to... What is this thing about vision? And what is it this about our God-given ability to imagine things that don't yet exist? This seems to be one of the things that we are capable of doing. And I presume that it was God's intention for us to exercise that. That God's vision is continuing and is being played out in the world in so many ways. I mean, the future is going to happen in one way or another. And is it going to go in the direction of God, or is it going to go in another direction? And you know that things can go in a lot of different directions. So it seems to me, just from a kind of a theological point of view, that we have that ability to see visions, to imagine big things, and that we might be called by God to participate in the creation of God's world right here on earth. We can see these things. We can imagine ways that they might happen. Now, Thomas Edison said once, the genius is 1% inspiration and 99%... Anyone know? Perspiration. Now, if you look online, and who knows about online, some people say it was 2%, 98%, but I figure in any event that it's just a little bit of inspiration and a whole lot of work. A whole lot of work. And sometimes the, the, the process of creating a big vision is really just the process of taking a lot of very small steps. I sometimes say, to, to describe myself in the way that uh, I don't feel like I necessarily have had any really big ideas, but I've had a bunch of really small ideas that have added up to big ideas. And this is the way I think it can work. In the same way that you saw this evolution of things you can fold out of paper, you know, it's kind of a leap between that crane and Iron Man. And yet, isn't that kind of indicative? You know, people in Japan in whatever century that was, it wouldn't have even occurred to them to fold Iron Man. Because at that point, Iron Man didn't exist. Somewhere, I Iron Man came into the world, I don't, again... What, who knows what was going on in the mind of the person who invented Iron Man to begin with, let alone the guy who decided I should fold it out of paper. So things don't exist, and suddenly they do, and ideas evolve, and they add on to each other over and over and over again. So little tiny things, little tiny steps that add up into big things. And sometimes I'm not even sure if you need that big a vision, that you need to know exactly where you're going. I think sometimes we have a general idea, we, kind of, we can identify the need, or we can see the problem, or we can see our desire, and we can take the step down the road, and eventually are continuing to step into that future, into that vision, is the thing that creates the big vision, that you can't even see the big vision until you get to the end. So I can imagine that there are people around, and I know there are, because I could, I could name you by name, the people in this congregation who have been willing to take step after step after step after step after step after step in order to create a big thing. I would just have to point out any of the women and men who sit down in the cellar thrift shop week after week, sorting through the stuff we bring them <laughs> and selling them. But you look at what's been accomplished over whatever it is, 26 years now, with the cellar thrift shop, step after step 
after step. Now, where's Lulu? Is she still here? Lulu, you wanted to know about the scarf. So, pretty nice, huh? And did you see that Shelly is wearing one, and Ernest has one, and Kelly has one? I brought four back. These came from our big meeting, our big church meeting, General Synod. They were knitted by people from all over the place. So here's, here was the vision. I think it was the conference minister in Pennsylvania decided, okay, we're going to invite people to knit rainbow scarves of all different types, and we're going to bring them to General Synod, and if someone signs a pledge against bullying, this was an anti-bullying campaign, if someone signs the pledge, they can have a scarf for free. They can have a scarf for free. And they thought maybe, oh, a couple of thousand scarves will come to General Synod. There were 12,000. 12,000. They were giving them away right and left. They had boxes of them in the booth in the display area. People were rummaging through them like the, like the bargain basement at Filene's, <laughs> if anyone knows what Filene's is. And people were, wore these the, the whole time. They were people on stage, people walking around, even though it was Long Beach and it was hot. Um, so I brought four of these home, and I thought, you know, every time that we wear these in worship, perhaps we'll remember that someone had a vision. You know, and actually it turned out the vision was even bigger than, than they, they had even imagined. So I started looking around the congregation and I just saw either a bunch of visionaries or a bunch of people who are like me who are <laughs> hyper-responsible and overachievers. I don't know which, but I think it's a good thing. So just a few of the things that people have imagined and created, and I apologize if I leave anybody out, I'm apologizing, I apologize if I kind of attribute the wrong thing to the wrong person, but, um, you know, Francis Town, Towns imagined the Berkeley Ecumenical Chaplaincy to the homeless. Barbara Ad Adicott was a prime mover with the Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay. Georgia Griffith imagined Amistad House, which is housing for, for seniors. Louise Specht put together action after action after action against torture. Becky Smith and, Marva, and John and Marva Don Norge, Norgard were major visionaries about the campus ministry program. Paul Chapman imagined green schools and also the first, first church green ministry team. Whole teams of people, people who worked on the plans for Plymouth House, the people who served on the, mission, the music visioning task force, uh, and, and the FAMCHI group. These were people, groups of people who came together to create vision. Anis Kukulong thought up the Gifts for the World Alternative Gifts Catalog and has been doing it for the last few years. Michelle McGoy and Solar Richmond. Jerry Ricca and, again, Barbara Atticott on the Solar Thrift Shop. Patty Contaxis imagined the Garage Door Nativity, that, that production. Hilary Perkins created sol Soldier Stories. Vicki Krebin and Greg Beatty have created several musical groups and lots of wonderful compositions. Charles Towns figured out the laser and the maser and got a Nobel Prize for it. Two. 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 Oh, two. See, count them. You must be an overachiever just like me, Charles. <laughs> Mo Wright. Now, Mo, oh, is Mo here this morning? No. Oh, good. So we can talk about him. <laughs> so Mo Wright is one of these people that, that I'm not sure he, he would even think of himself as a visionary. I don't know how he considers himself. But almost everything that happens, a whole bunch of things that have happened at First Church has, have, become, have happened because Mo Wright thought it was possible and was willing to take the steps that would need to be taken in order for something to happen. So Mo's the sort of person who you come to him with idea, he, and you, he doesn't say no. He says, oh, oh. And then, in his quiet Mo way, he takes all of those steps to make things happen. Don't tell him I told you this. <laughs> Roger Bash has had a hand in reshaping most of the, the church in one way or another. Berdekan Berryessa imagined the school program in Ethiopia. Robin Kempster is starting the parish nursing program and was involved in creating the Sunday Salon. Holly Coates Bash, also involved in the salon and also the children's art project, the artwork we see around. And Catherine Kuntz created 50 art shows in the Sunburst Gallery, and even as other people have taken on that task, that vision carries on. So here we are, creating new things. We're seeing God's vision. We're creating the world in the way that we think God calls us to. And sometimes it's through that spark of inspiration or an idea. Sometimes it takes several people to spark an idea. 
and then a whole lot of work, willing to take step after step after step after step after step. You say it. After step, yeah. It just it, it takes it takes a lot of courage, and that's where. We need sustenance. That's why we gather together to remind us that we can stay on the path toward God's vision. We can stay on the path toward God's vision. Now, Jesus had a vision, a vision of creating the world in a completely different way. And perhaps that's where we take some of our creative courage. We can see that he came into the world to give people a different idea about the way things might be. And so he did this really simple thing at one point in his ministry. He gathered a bunch of people. They were gathered in a room, and it was a simple meal. And he took the bread and the cup, and he put some words around it. That it was clear that he was doing more than just serving the people food. And of course, it would be odd that he would be the server anyway, wouldn't it? But he took on that role because he was willing to serve. And he shared the bread and the cup in a special way. And who knows if this was even his vision. But now this meal is served almost everywhere. And it's served over and over and over again, step by step. By step, little, little piece of bread by little piece of bread, little sip of, of the juice or the wine, little sip. But step by step by step. And so now, this morning, we gather around the table. You know, at the 9 o'clock service, we have communion every Sunday. And when we're gathering in the summer here, we do that same thing of being able to participate in this vision. Perhaps this will be an opportunity for you to say, yes, I am on this road, I need help. Yes, I am on this road, I don't know what the next step is. Yes, I am on this road, I can see something, but can you open the picture up just a little bit more? Whatever it is, this meal can serve to feed you. It can help open your eyes and open your heart, and open your minds. There's a song that we sing sometimes as we're gathering at the table. Uh, let me sing it through the first time, and then we'll sing it all together. Life and love surround us. Friendship binds the soul. Life and love will carry us, and the mystery of God makes us whole. Try it with me. Life and love will crown us. Friendship binds the soul. Life and love will carry us, and the mystery of God makes us whole again. Life and love surround us. Friendship binds the soul. Life and love will carry us, and the mystery of God makes us whole. Amen.